speaker, Roy, uh, who's talking to us about some aqua club. And I've asked him if he had any adventures to try and tell us about those as well. Right. Okay, lovely, thank you. Should I try and put the mic just in case it's... Um, yeah, I've got a few dead ones. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I think I need a mic then, yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay then. No problem at no problem at all. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all I'd like to say um, it's been a great honour for me to have been invited to this lunch today, which I've really enjoyed. Uh, well, yeah, it's yeah, it's lovely Bill. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. 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 It's important I get that message across. Um, <laughs> It's also wonderful to be able to give this presentation as well that you're going to see now. Um, I'm, a, I'm a scuba diving instructor so I'm used to, to talking and hopefully it will be a presentation which you will all enjoy. As you probably already gathered, I haven't worked with microphones very often so um, just be prepared to be a little bit flexible if you can't hear me because I probably haven't got it too near my mouth. Okay, so that's it really. Um, what we're going to look at is an overview of scuba diving around the UK from its earliest days until the current times. At the end of the session, um, which will last probably about half an hour, there will be an opportunity for people to ask questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer you the questions. If not, then I can return to you at another time with the, the answers. I can, I can look them up, I don't know everything. Um, but also I've got some scuba equipment with me which you, which you might be able to be uh, interested in. You'll be able to have a look at that as well and get some hands on um, as, as you know, as you, as, 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 whichever you would like. So that, that opportunity is there as well. Okay then, let's go into this uh, presentation and, and, and um, take a look at scuba diving. Okay, the first thing we're looking at is the uh, British Sub Aqua Club and we're going to look at the, the background and structure. The BSAC formed in London in 1953. Um, the founding member was a, a fellow called Oscar Guggen and he was assisted by another chap called Peter Small who was a journalist at the time. And uh, they started to basically put the, uh, the, the basic um, uh, concept that they had, this idea that they had to, to create a scuba club uh, together. Um, the first branch was actually called, uh, created in London as well, as you might expect, and it was called London Number One Branch. No surprises there, as it was the first branch. Um, it's still there today. It's based in Marylebone in London's Westminster, West One, and it's uh, highly successful. It's it's uh, been thriving now for uh, you know over uh, 50 years, I guess. It's, it's been around a long time. BSAC is the governing body for sport diving. Now, as strange as it might see for those of you who, are, who have never dived or never looked at diving, um, there is no law, there is no current law that says you must um, follow a, 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 a specific uh, training course to become qualified as a scuba diver. You can actually go into a diving shop, buy um, a load of diving equipment, put it on and head for the nearest open water venue, perhaps a, a local lake or something, and jump in, and you won't be arrested because there's no law against diving. But obviously it's not really the sensible way to learn how to scuba dive if, you want, if you've got safety in mind. Um, so the BSAC have devised a, a, an excellent course to make sure that anyone who is interested in this sport um, <clears throat> follows a, a properly structured uh, course that's broken down into nice, small, easy to learn steps so that people who aren't, uh, can't pick things up very quickly can soon grasp um, what it is that's being taught. Headquarters is based in Ellesmere Port, Cheshire. I think I mentioned Ellesmere Port to someone once and they thought it was a table wine, but it's actually a place near Liverpool. Okay, it's managed by a national diving committee, like lots of large bodies, um, they're, they're, they're structured with a committee uh, and obviously uh, the committee consists of lots of people made up, um, um, it's made up of lots of people which carry on different roles, um, secretary is one example, a treasurer is, is another which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It provides training and uh, various publications and many other goods from its shop. A monthly magazine called Scuba and a voice for its member, members or membership. It currently has more than 33,000 members 
in over 1,100 branches worldwide. This number actually fluctuates, as I'm sure you can um, imagine, as uh, trends in society change and uh, things become uh, priced, the cost of things go up, which we, which we all know uh, about. And um, so, I mean, I mean, they had a really successful time, probably around the mid 80s, I think it was, when membership had actually crept up to uh, about 50,000. And it started to drop off again after that. Um, apart, and it's a fact also of life that when, when something is, is introduced and, and suddenly it's all new and, and exciting, there comes a time, you know, and people start getting on the bandwagon or taking an interest. It, it's starting to go up and up and up with interest. It sort of gets to a peak and then it starts to drop off a bit. So, well, it's, this is exactly the same thing in the, the scuba diving world. Um, but the good news is it's actually starting to pick up again now, and um, which is which is great from those who are already members, and uh, it's obviously good for those who, who are, who are fi uh, finding this sport. Teddington's, uh, to be a, the, all these members belong to different branches. It's all one club, but it's, it's divided into many hundreds of different branches um, around the country. And um, one of the, the branches that I'm quite uh, heavily involved with is Teddington Sub Aqua Club, which um, I played a major part in forming as the branch diving officer um, for the first four years. Let's take a look at the way, uh, let's take a closer look at uh, Teddington Sub Aqua Club. Okay, the history and structure is that it's, um, it, we formed in 1997, January to be precise, and like the BSAC, it is managed by a committee. Key roles or key positions in the branch are diving officer, the one person in the branch who organises dives, and um, they're, they're sort of like the hub of a wheel, if you like. Uh, they're, they're the one person in the branch that a lot of things revolve around. A branch diving officer will always want to know, um, always want, always be interested in talking to the equipment officer to make sure that equipment is, is being kept up to standard and the training officer for training and, and that sort of thing. So the diving officer is, is quite a busy role, if you like. Another uh, important role is training officer, and, um, and that their role is uh, is there in the description. They're, they're responsible for training. They actually take a part in training divers, but they also help to train instructors. All members of the BSAC are volunteers, and they volunteer their services free of charge. Uh, there are some occasions where they may get their expenses back, perhaps travel expenses, um, but certainly they don't get paid for teaching people to dive. The branch is funded by um, members' uh, subscriptions, annual subscriptions, and uh, various fundraising activities. Okay, let's look at some diving grades. Anyone joining the club will f start with an entry level course which is known as Ocean Diver. Once a colleague qualifies as an Ocean Diver, there's higher diving grades to go for. The next one up is Sports Diver, Dive Leader, you've got, after that you've got Advanced Diver, and if you're, for those who are really keen, you've got First Class Diver, which is the highest um, diving grade that the BSAC offers. It's a national exam, a two day national exam. It's um, very, uh, it's very, uh, Intense, um, but it's. Uh, it's a very. It's a very. It's a very. Did I switch it off? <coughs> I don't think so. Here we go. Yeah, there you go, Ken. I've broken it. No working parts, and I was watering it. Did I touch something there? Got the bench. She will fix it. One, two. If that light is on, it's working. No. Just shout. Just shout. Oh dear. Oh dear, mate. Good, you have another go. Okay. Nothing, nothing important, not your air supply, that never 
So uh, that, you've got those diving grades and, and we've got to where we are so far. Anyone who's interested in teaching diving can get their foot on the instructor ladder once they've reached sports diver grade. Okay, so you need a little bit of knowledge first by using <coughs> ocean diver and then just a little bit more knowledge and experience at the sports diver level and then you can step onto the instructor ladder where you learn how to teach and uh, present theory lessons to a classroom full of people or learn how to teach lessons uh, in, the, in the water. BSAC offer a wide range of skill development courses. These are basically supplementary courses which are all related in one way or another to diving. And uh, they can be about boat handling, chart work and navigation, underwater archaeology, oxygen administration, practical rescue management, first aid. There's probably about, I would think, in excess of at least 30 different courses that you can actually take as a BSAC member, which are all related to diving or rescue and, and the, the care and, and looking after divers. Right, let's have a look at what ocean diver training actually involves. We know, we know it's the entry level. Let's see what someone coming into it is going to face. Okay, well first of all they get some theory lectures and then they can start training in the swimming pool. Okay, that's an ideal environment. It's nice and warm. It's nice and shallow. It's a controlled uh, uh, conditions to be in. And um, that's, that's the ideal place to learn. Actually, in, in tropical parts of the world, you can learn in shallow um, shore, shoreline, sh maybe areas that have been sealed off. Um, those areas can be used in, in, in nice climates. But over here, of course, we, have, we don't normally get, it's, you know, the conditions are not really ideal. There's a picture of me in my early pool training. Uh, not quite, not quite. That, that actually is um, a German adventure and that, re that relates to about to 1729 I think. But uh, that, that is some early diving equipment. So I think mean, 1729 indicates that we've been around some time. Seventeen seventeen ninety seven was the correct date. I just I just did a check on that, just to make sure. Um, yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it, when you think that we started off looking like that, uh, but we've developed, you know, quite a bit from then, and we're going to take a closer look at that as we move into, into that. Okay, so the trainee starts in the pool, and it's there that they uh, learn to use what we call basic equipment. Basic equipment is three things: it's mask snorkel and fins. Divers need a mask so that they can see underwater. If they haven't got a mask, the eyes can't focus in the natural medium of air, which we're all used to. And I'm sure you've all opened your eyes underwater in the bath as children, uh, and all you've got is a blur. Well, it's exactly what you would see in, in, with diving if you didn't have a mask on. They also um, use a snorkel so that they can look down onto the reef and they can breathe with their face down in the water without having to keep to look up to take a breath. Okay, so they're nice there, they're, they're on above the reef, they're looking at the fish, they can just breathe normally, and they wear fins for propulsion. Okay, now some people think you wear them for speed. We don't, when, we, when we're underwater, we don't want to go fast. We're going to frighten marine life, and we're going to um, tire ourselves out. It's much better to relax and take it nice and steady, but we do need fins for propulsion. They learn how to fin properly. You get typically a trainee will start by using a cycling motion, but the idea is to keep the legs nice and straight and, 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 and give a better finning motion. And they learn how to do surface dives. Surface dives is, is basically self-descriptive. You can imagine the diver swimming along the surface. They put their head down. They lift their legs up. Trip. The weight of their body will take them underwater. They go down. They look at the reef. They come back up. Surface dives. It's very very they're very simple to do. They learn all this in the swimming pool. And of course they learn signals that they will use throughout their diving adventures. Okay, an example of, is of diving signals, I'll give you three now I think. One is, this one is okay, that's an okay signal. Um, this, this one is me, this one would be you. Well, I don't have to point with two hands, I could say, I could go like this, in which case I'm saying I'm okay or I could be asking you people if you are okay. 
And when, what, what we do as divers, when we get a signal, we have to return it. Otherwise, if you give someone a signal and they, have, they don't respond, you don't know whether they've, you know, what they're going to do, you don't know whether they've seen you or anything. <coughs> okay, so that, that's two examples of signals. Um, the signals that divers like most is this one, because that means go down. We like being underwater. The one they dislike the most is this one. What do you think that one means? Go up, go up. Okay. Um, so there's some examples of signals. Signals. <laughs> they also learn to use and prepare an aqualung. Again, an aqualung consists of three pieces of equipment. The primary piece is the cylinder, which contains the breathing gas. Another part of it is the jacket, what it fits like a waistcoat, and that's called um, a buoyancy jacket or adjustable buoyancy life jacket. And of course we have what we call a demand valve, that's the bit that goes in the mouth and we breathe from. And that's giving you air from your cylinder, or whatever gas you've got in your cylinder. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Am I going too slow? Yeah. Am I going too fast? No, too deep. <laughs> not going deep enough for my liking. Okay, so we've looked at a little bit of early diving equipment, 1797. Um, diving equipment, along with diving techniques, continues to develop even to this day. Uh, as new equipment is invented, there's not um, so much massive new new things being developed, but certainly new little little bits and pieces are being invented all the time to assist the divers, make their life easier, maybe make their life safer. Um, and certainly new materials and new manufacturing processes are evolving all the time. I'm sure we all know that. Um, here's a picture of me during my early open water training. Very early. Very early. Again, not quite right, not quite factually correct, but but uh, again, it's another piece of early <coughs> diving equipment. It's, a, it's what we could, uh, it's an early diving bell, basically. And that one was um, invented by um, <coughs> a, a, a German, actually, yeah. called uh, Franz Kessler in 1616. Can you imagine somebody's walking around in that, uh, you know, around it's the time, really 50 neat. years yeah. before the Great Fire in London? Yeah. You could um, Twitter under there, didn't you? So, <laughs> you know, it does go back a long time. Ron goes to sleep with one of them. <laughs> Basically, you've got somebody under that, and that's that's their air supply. They don't need a face mask because they've got the little holes to look through. Um, but the problem with something like that is, is, is a fairly obvious one. If they trip up, all that air is going to escape, and they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Especially if they've got a big ball of weight like that one there is, keeping them down on the bottom. Okay, so equip the type of diving equipment that you're more likely to see this day and age looks like this. Okay, so this is a typical modern diver. There's his cylinder. There's the buoyancy compensator or a buoyancy jacket that, that I mentioned earlier. He's got a mask and snorkel there. He's got a couple of regulators. One is going to be his primary regulator. Pardon me, or demand valve. They're both one with the same thing. And the other one is going to be a spare one which either he or she can use or their buddy can use. Okay? Now that I've just put a, an important safety thing in there is we always dive, we, we don't dive alone. Um, we dive in, in pairs, normally in twos or, or greater numbers, uh, and we work together as buddies. We all help each other. Um, so there's a spare regulator for the buddy should they need it. Uh, there's a, a console the with various gauges on it. Um, a di most people these days have, uh, have a dive computer which carries a wealth of information on it. A weight belt is needed to get the diver down because no matter how heavy you think you are when you're in water, you're very, very mm. prone to, to being um, positively buoyant, floating. You're going to have problems getting down. So you really do need a weight belt. Booties are worn with some types of suits um, and fins that we've already mentioned are used for propulsion. Do you all agree that there's a slight difference between the early diving equipment and this one? Yeah. Of course, one thing, uh, important thing for me to mention at this point, with that earlier diving gear, like the bell and the earlier suit that we've just looked at, is uh, the fact that they were invented for commercial reasons, okay, not for sport diving. Whereas all this stuff that we're looking at there now on the picture on the right is for um, 
sport diving or fun diving, scuba, um, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. We're not getting our supply from the service, we're taking it with us, we can go where we want, we can do what we want. It's a different, it's a different type of diving. Okay, so we've looked at training, we've done our pool training, we've done some, uh, oh, we've done our initial open water skills, we know what diving kit's all about because we've been taught that, but now we're going to go um, diving. But before we do, there's one thing, a very, very important thing to think about, and of course that is... Can you swim? Safety. That's <laughs> <laughs> now we've already worked that one out. <laughs> um, it's a very... Uh, it's a very important subject, okay? So we, we, there are some safety things to think about. For example... How deep are you going to go? The effects of pressure. Mm. Okay, divers have to be very, very careful to avoid pressure injuries. Pressure injuries in the lungs, it can be in the ears, it can be uh, maybe in a cavity of a tooth if a, a filling hasn't gone well, it can be in the gut. Um, airways, airways or flexible breathing spaces that contain pressure have to be managed. Okay, and you do this, we do this by keeping um, the pressures equalised. Even a diver's mask contains air, and as they go down, the pressure on the mask increases. If they don't equalise that by breathing into the mask through a little, little nose well, then they're going to suffer um, potential injuries around the eyes. Okay, the type of breathing gas is a consideration. It is two these days. In, in the early days it just used to be air. And then, um, of course, air is a mixture of gases. It's, it's about 20% oxygen and about 79% uh, nitrogen and the one percent, the other 1% is mixed gases uh, like uh, uh, xenon and argon and, and um, various other gases, CO2, um, CO, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. But they're only all in trace elements, so they're not, they're not, we're not too worried about those. And for certainly the gas is a consideration. Nitrox is basically um, air with a higher level of oxygen in it. So some of the nitrogen has been removed and an increased level of oxygen has been put in. Helium is uh, an inert gas that is also used to replace the space that might be occupied by nitrogen. Okay, so the, these gases do affect how deep you can go. Um, if you go deep with, even if you go deep with air beyond 60 metres, you risk um, oxygen toxicity because of a thing called the what the, you get chemical reaction between the compressed oxygen in, in the mix at that depth. And so, of course, you, if you're going deep, you need to reduce oxygen, but you need to replace it with something else. Helium is an example. Uh, something that's not that's, that's inert and not going to do any harm. Certainly you need to consider the type of boat you're going on. This is a, t a classic dive boat used these days and they're fantastic. Okay, the type, this type of boat, the obvious thing to me as a, as a diver that jumps out is it's, it's, it's nice and open, and on, on days like that, that's fantastic, although you might need to shelter from the sun. The opposite side of the coin on that one, of course, is that if it was cold, you might, need, you might need shelter from the wind and the cold. So, I mean, those are two considerations with a boat like that. If you've got a boat where you can actually all get in the wheelhouse, where the skipper's going to be, then fine, but in that, on that particular boat, it doesn't look as if you're going to get 12 people and a skipper in there. Um, but so, so the type of boat is a consideration. This particular one has a, an um, a hydraulic lift at the back, which is uh, usually electric or hydraulically uh, operated by the skipper to lift divers out the water. So it's very easy for us to get in the water, we just step off of that side. At the end of the dive, the skipper comes round, we, we swim onto a little platform, hold on like this, we've got our regulators in our mouths, don't forget, so we give him a nod like that, he knows we're on in position, he lifts us up, and we just walk into the boat and sit down. It's, my, it's a luxury diving. Years ago, we used to have uh, what we call herringbone type ladders, where you went up like this, one foot at a time, with your cylinder on your back, and it was very, very much uh, hard work. Nowadays, these automatic lifts are fantastic. Okay, so certainly the boat is a consideration. Where's the bar? Sorry? Where's the bar? <laughs> the bar? Um, 
That comes after the boat. <laughs> okay, another con consideration, of course, is sea conditions. Okay, if you've got conditions like that, then that skipper in that picture is not going to be anywhere near that rock, is he? He doesn't want that boat, which probably cost him 160,000 plus, smash the bits on the rocks. And the divers don't want a long swim back to shore either. So, in weather like that, you wouldn't go diving. It only has to be half as bad as that and you wouldn't go diving. I don't know what wind force that is, it doesn't tell me in the book, I just took that off the top of uh, the World Wide Web. Um, but uh, a consideration with, with boats and safety is that getting a diver in the water is not a problem. If I was fully kitted up as a diver, I'd love to go into rough water, I, I love jumping into water. The higher and the, and the more dangerous is, you know, more of a challenge it is. But the problem is getting back onto the boat. You know, if you've got a, you're yeah. waiting for the back of the boat to come down, if it hits you on the head, you're going to be out of action. You're going to come, uh, you're going to be a lot worse off for the boat. So, so certainly sea conditions are a consideration. And of course, sea conditions are primarily driven by the weather. Okay, so if you've got bad weather, you're going to, probably going to get bad uh, sea conditions. Even if the sea's calm, you might have mist or fog. You know, you, you've got a lack of visibility. Divers come up over there instead of over here. The skipper doesn't see them. They've drifted away. You've got two missing divers or whatever. So those are some of the safety issues. Okay, so we've considered the safety issues. So now we're going to go diving. These are two typical sites that uh, all diving clubs visit. Certainly, TS Teddington Sub Aqua Club visit sites like this regularly. You've got lots of wrecks around the UK. I think there's over 200,000. We've got a fantastic maritime history all around us because of the people that tried to invade us and, and the, the way we stopped them. There's, there's planes down there, battleships, submarines, everything, um, Sainsbury's trolleys, everything you could think of. <laughs> Skodas, there's a few Skodas down there. Um, I hope nobody's got a Skoda. Um, so that was it. Of course, Scapa Flow is, you've got the German World War. German First World War battle fleet down there, not sunk by us, uh, but actually sunk by them as they, they, they uh, scuttled the ships uh, because they thought we were going to take them off and use them against them. There was an armistice thing going on, I don't know if you all know the story, but um, the German Admiral at the time thought that uh, we were going to take, uh, it had been extended, he wasn't sure if we were going to take his boats and use them against them. So 72 boats were basically uh, scuppered but um, I think only something like 57 went down. Uh, some, something like 20 odd were, were actually saved by the British. By the British. Um, okay, so, so I mean, wrecks, wrecks like that are fantastic. They're great fun. They're, they're a, an attraction for marine life. And if you put a boat down like that, um, that's in, in top condition, within a couple of months, you're going to get that sort of marine life growth on it. It very quickly starts to become a place for of safety for for marine creatures to live in and grow. Um, on the right, obviously, you've got coral reefs. They're fantastic as well if you like that type of diving. Not everybody's taste, so I have to say, <coughs> because uh, clouds are nice coloured fish. They can get a bit boring after a while. Mm. And um, the type of uh, uh, by contrast, you've got the British wreck, which is normally deep, dangerous, creaking bulkheads. It's falling to bits. Visibility is very poor. I wouldn't be able to see any of you now if, if we were on some of those British wrecks in the channel. And, um, you know, they're potentially a lot more dangerous. And, and for some people, that's it's a little bit more exciting. So, but obviously, you, you put a little bit, a lot more planning into it, diving those type of wrecks. It looks like the people there are carrying out some sort of marine conservation type project. <coughs> Typically, we see there's two examples in a marine life we see. <coughs> the old cuttlefish, and what we call tompot blenny. There's different types of blennies, that's a tompot. Um, and they're widely distributed all around the UK. Even the, even there, You even find those in the Mediterranean. And um, you actually get cuttlefish down the, uh, the southwest coast of Africa, I was reading the other day. Marine life is not really a threat to the diver. One of the reasons I was a bit slow to take up diving, I always feared the underwater world by the seaside. I didn't even like wading up to my knees because I had this vision of sharks and giant octopus 
you know, which have been fed to me through comics and things as a child. And, and you ma I imagine, must have grown up like many others, imagining that that was the underwater well. It's not. You go down there, you go 10, 12, 20 miles offshore, drop down onto a wreck like that, the one we just looked at, and uh, there's hardly any marine life there. It's all been fished out, dredged out, there's nets everywhere or whatever. It's a terrible state, state of affairs. So people like um, Hugh, Hugh Whittingstall and, and, and trying to kickstart this marine conservation project um, that's, that's going on, and, and we're getting successful at, it is a fantastic way to preserve our marine heritage. Okay, we're not just a diving cup, and we do like to put something back into the local community as and when we can. We are involved with our community in the following ways. We work with a group called uh, Wendy's, Wendy's Swimming Group, and they're a group of youngsters with a variety of special needs, such as autism, Down syndrome, and a lot of other physical or mental setbacks. Uh, but, they're, but they can be safe, they can actually make safe divers. And um, certainly for the youngsters that we bring in, that come into the club on, on several occasions annually, um, get a fantastic amount of joy out of, out of being led round a, looked after and taken round a swimming pool uh, with an aqualum on their back. It's a totally um, wonderful experience for them. And I've never yet, we've never yet had one of them that hasn't enjoyed it. They come back every year, the same people, time and time again, as well as new ones, because it, they're just like uh, little terrapins in a, in a fish tank. You know, they're, they're just so excited about it all. You know, it's fantastic. And of course, the people, uh, the, the leaders, the dive leaders, and the instructors in our branch who take these children down get a, get a fantastic amount of um, feeling and, 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 and vibes back for, for for doing that and giving them that experience. <coughs> There's a picture of two, two of the youngsters there. Wendy is in the top right hand corner. And uh, there's, there's three instructors there and some parents. And basically that's just after a little session in the pool about, um, about six months ago, I think that was. We also run what we call tri-dives. A tri-dive is basically what it says it is. It's an opportunity for someone that's what, uh, seen diving on the television over many years, always wanted to give it a try. They don't really know whether it's for them, so they haven't put themselves on a, on a, on a fairly expensive course. Um, and they just want a quick go and see what it's like. And, and this is called a tri-dive. And, and effectively, they, get, they will get 40 minutes on, on Aqualung or thereabouts, going around the pool and pra maybe practicing a few skills if they're confident enough to do that. And a lot of people, I would say probably 60%, actually go, go on to entry level diving courses because they want to take it a step further. You know, they, they enjoy it. The other thing we do is we provide emergency cover for events on the Thames. This can be canoeing, it can be board sailing, it can be swimming from, from one bridge to another, it can be new, numerous events on the Thames. And sometimes we're asked to do that and, and we go and help out with that as well. Okay, so let's uh, summarise on what we've looked at. We've looked at the BSAC, the British Sub Aqua Club, and TSAC, Teddington Sub Aqua Club, their history and their structure. We've looked at various diving rates, and we know that the entry level is Ocean Diver. We've looked at ocean diver training, and we know that the young trainee starts in the swimming pool and, and learning theory in the classroom, and then they do a couple of uh, open water sessions to get as they as they progress into open water. They also do a little written test as well. We've looked at diving equipment. Two examples of old diving equipment: a suit and another example of a, a very early diving bell. We've looked at safety issues, some, some of the safety issues. Pressures one, weather, the type of boat, the type of breathing gas we're going to use. We've looked at it, that type of thing. Um, 
We've looked at places Teddington would like to go to, which of course is uh, wrecks and reefs, warm climates, as well as cold ones. We've looked at two examples of marine life we see regularly on dives. And we've looked at uh, three different ways that we support our community. That's about it from me. So I would like to thank you all for your interest. Oh, uh, welcome any questions that you've got. And I've actually got an aqualung over there and some basic equipment that you can actually look at if you wanted to. And uh, you can ask me questions on that as well. Thank you much indeed, Roy. Um, can we go Please. Jim. I'll just ask one, if I may. A lot of the wrecks around the UK coast are classified as war graves. Are you allowed to dive on them? Some war, okay, the, the question is war grave, uh, wrecks classed as war graves. Um, certainly you can dive on some war graves and, and others you can't, and these are called protected wreck sites. Um, you know, for, 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 for no, normally where there's, there's been a, a loss of life um, for, the, for those reasons. <coughs> Uh, the Royal Open mm -hmm. is an example of that, which is up in Orkney, um, and up in Scapa Flow. But, uh, but now and again, some people do dive it, maybe to put um, a reef on it, or, or a flap or something. Um, so yeah, no, there, you are restricted on some, but not all, certainly. <laughs> certainly. Do we have a local uh, sub aqua club here in this area? Yeah. That's a good question. Well, I'm actually, my club is at, the BSAC is split down into various regions. And I think we've something, got something like 15 regions in, in the UK at the moment, as well as having some in Europe and some overseas, further, further overseas, further oh, far east. Um, I, the, the, I, there's almost certainly going to be a, a local scuba club within within a 10, 15 mile radius, I would have thought. You know, this, I think this area actually comes under the southeast region. Um, What's the earliest age for a try dive for a children? Try dive can be taken at any age. It's really down to it, providing they get, the child can get the, the mouthpiece in their mouth mm -hmm. easily enough. Then, 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 then there's, there's not really a lower age limit. Okay. There's certainly no upper mm -hmm. age limit for try dives or diving generally. And, um, and obviously, in the case of children, a disclaimer is signed. Yeah, by that parent or guardian. Sure. I was just going to ask, do the um, oh, do all commercial divers start off yeah, through right. this way, or do they? Is there a separate sort of way that commercial divers learn their skills? There's different ways. There's different uh, avenues to explore. You've actually got two routes there. It's a good question. Some people go go into sport diving and, and then enjoy it so much, and maybe they're lucky enough to be young enough when they suddenly come come across it to uh, pursue a, co a career in commercial diving. That can be done. And you've got uh, the other road, which, which people go straight into, into the commercial field. You don't have to start off as a sports diver. Quite often we find that people who have been commercial divers for many years and have been um, working under, pardon me, very stringent regulations and a manual this thick of what they should do and can do and can't do, they actually come into sports diving because it's much more relaxing. You know, it's for a more, it's more enjoyment. It's not work, it's kind of like enjoyment. You know, imagine if you're if you're um, you're driving a driver to the for royalty. You, when you when you're driving, it's not going to be as much fun. Maybe it's not. Gonna, you're going to be a lot more relaxed when you just go into Norfolk for a couple of weeks' holiday, aren't you, with the family? Mm -hmm. it's, one question. Yeah. Yeah. Over there. One question. We see a lot of diving on television and so forth. And yeah. they, they use voice communication in the mast now. Is that something that you get into, or is that really reserved for those sort of um, occasions? There's, uh, those, most of those are Kirby Morgan bandmasks and they've got internal communications which obviously allow divers to communicate to, each, to the, the people that they're working with or indeed the surface cover um, about what they're doing and what, they, what they're being told to do. It's something, we, we try the band, head masks on now and again just for experience but we don't use them as sports divers. Um, I have, I've certainly had experience on one. They're good fun. It's, it's a, it is a new experience, and uh, that they've been the hard hat helmets have been around for a long time. They were in, the, the first effective um, pressure, very effective pressure sealed um, divers helmet was invented by, funnily enough, by another German. The Germans have played three major steps in, in diving, the development of diving equipment. There's a chap called. Um, C. 
C.B. Gorman, Augustus C.B. Gorman, uh, Augustus C.B. And um, his equipment uh, has been developed since then and still used today. Come on. Yes. Thanks, please. Yes. Um, what, what, what I would like to add to what I've already said is I've got some handout sheets here which contain um, the, key, the key elements of the entire lecture the, as bullet points and on that there's an email address. If you want this presentation I can send it to you or I can send you uh, an electronic version and you can download your own coloured hard copies. Um, is it enough for everybody? Thank you, Mr President Fellows. I'm sure you all know about the background of how to get into and all about um, diving through the Samacro Club. It's just a shame that uh, Roy doesn't have enough time to tell us any of his uh, experiences or adventures he oh, might sorry. have had. Yeah, I, I can actually do that. I forgot that, didn't I? Sorry, <laughs> quite right. But uh, that was very, very informative, and I'm sure you all know much more than you ever did before. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other business? Yeah. Can I remind you of the apologies book? The menu, well, that's fresh in our minds, uh, and to look at the website. Could you be outstanding and join me in the final toast, please? Oh, I'm sure to do that.